Welcome to the gathering and thank you for joining us today. I'm Robin Durham. I have a special guest with me in the studio today, Mr. Al Houghton from Yorba Linda, California. Welcome, Al. Thanks, Robin. It's a privilege to be here. First time you've been in Colleen, I hear. It is. And yep, a, this oh. is my baptism. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, Colleen is uh, kind and welcome. And uh, we're glad that you're here. Um, Al is a tremendous teacher uh, of the Word of God. I'm going to read a little of his bio. He is a father in the faith formed in fire. Al lives in California where he earned a Master's of Divinity degree in theology and began his ministry over 40 years ago traveling to the nations and establishing Word at Work daily Bible studies. He's authored six books, Sure Mercies of David, Purifying the Altar, Marked Men, Jesus and Justice, God-layered love and con converts are disciples. I'm telling you, that's you're pro a prolific writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, after 37 years of Bible studies and six books, one which is out of print, actually seven, so that would be purifying the altar. I guess I am. I have to plead guilty. Yes, you do. <laughs> well, Al has been. Um, teaching I've known of you maybe for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to a, a series on the Sure Mer Mercies of David. Yeah. And then more recently, Al has been in and out of our region teaching a Glow International as well as many other yes. places in Texas, Cross Plains, up Cross in Waco oh, yeah. fairly recently. And uh, you can check out his website. It's www.wordatwork.org. And uh, you'll be able to take a look at his, some of his books. You'll be able to look at the Word at Work Bible studies and just check it out. It's good. Um, Al is in to teach a seminar for uh, Compass Regional Network and I asked him to come in and share with you because I know you're going to be blessed. And um, In talking on the phone a month or so ago, I found out that the Lord had given him a fresh revelation and uh, he's going to be sharing with us today on God's prophetic pattern for the church to wind up this age. I, I said yay when I heard the title <laughs> that um, it would be great to wind up this age. And, um, <laughs> You know, it's not an easy time that we're living in, and yet it's an awesome time for the church. It's going to be an awesome time it for is. the church once we step up into the place that God's called us to step yes. into. A, a glorious time. And, and actually, when, I mean, that's a mouthful, a prophetic pattern for winding up the age. And yet, uh, every major prophetic transition in Scripture from the beginning, God has spread over two generations. It took uh, Moses to bring him uh, out of Egypt, but it took Joshua to bring him in. Mm -hmm. It took David to do all the plans and get the material for the temple, but Solomon had to build it. So even Christ, when he came, he uh, trained Peter and the 12 and the 120, and yet it took a second generation in Paul to finish that process. And so it looks like we are going to see the same thing in the winding up of the age, that the Lord is going to spread it over two generations. And we see that in Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and He's coming in on two donkeys, not one. And it's two generations. It's a, 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 That's good. The, the colt and the donkey. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting thing about the donkey is that it was never ridden. It had ne an unbroken animal. So you've got one generation that ends up paying the price, the preparational price that is accepted for the next generation. And so that means if we are that first generation, we get the plans, we get the anointing, we possess the uh, wealth that is needed to wind up the age, then we get to raise up a generation who, if they will come alongside of us, if they will choose to um, let us mentor them, if they will embrace the humility that that takes, mm -hmm. then they can uh, take everything that we have given and go out like Solomon. Solomon did not have to fight any of the wars that King David did. All he had to do was build a type and shadow temple. Mm -hmm. And we're going to populate a real temple made of living stones. And that generation who has the humility to come and receive 
what the previous generation pioneered, they're the ones that are actually going to go out and do it. So when we talk about this end time pattern, we need to say, hey, this covers two generations. That's interesting. So um, the generation that's on the face of the earth now, our generation is the generation that has prepared. Do you feel that? Or are we not even that? <laughs> that that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I feel like we are that Davidic generation. Mm -hmm. We are called to walk as David walked, and we're only missing a couple of elements of uh, that, that Davidic preparation. So if we can understand the uh, covenant of sure mercy, if we can see those elements all blended together out of the book of Joel, then I think we can assemble the pattern, we can birth the anointing, and believe it or not, I expect we are, based on what the Lord has revealed to me, that we're going to possess the wealth to do this thing. But we have to pass it on. We, we can't have sticky fingers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's going to cost us something. So you said, and in brief, understand the sure mercies of David. Just brief. Just brief. <laughs> the sure mercies of David is a two-edged sword. Okay. Now, that's, that's the part. We have the first edge of mercy, but we don't have the second edge. And the covenant of sure mercy God gave to King David in 2 Samuel 7. Actually, I was in Germany when the Lord spoke this to me. I was teaching. I was in about 200 Germans, and I was teaching. And the Lord says, uh, while I'm talking, He says, when did I speak to my servant David about his son Solomon before or after he met Bathsheba? I said, what? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying. fortunately I had a translator, so I had a few seconds to process. And uh, God said, when did I speak to my servant David about his son Solomon before or after he met Bathsheba? I said, God, I don't know. Find out. Okay, on the way to lunch, as soon as I finished, on the way to lunch, I'm in the car, I'm flipping through, I'm trying to find, when did you speak to David about his son Solomon? Four chapters before David encounters Bathsheba. So before David ever sinned, God promised he would have uh, through his lineage, there would be a man on the throne. And gave him a covenant and said in that covenant, 2 Samuel mm -hmm. 7, if you have a failure, I will not take my mercy from you as I took it from Saul who was before you. Amen. I will redeem your failure, David, and I will cause it to praise me. I will make your failure your greatest strength. That's good news for all of us. It is very you know, good news. It's good news that we can repent as David did. Absolutely. And not lose our place in Christ. And come into restoration and have God redeem it mm -hmm. so that it becomes a platform for all future ministry. That's really good. Solomon was born out of that union and Solomon built the temple. He finished David's dream. Mm -hmm. Out of his failure came the son that would build his dream. God saying to all of us and every generation that followed, I'm the only one that can redeem sin and make it praise me. That's, that's so, really wonderful. And Isaiah 55 says, when you and I choose, instead of criticizing, bad mouthing, castigating, uh, pushing aside, when we choose to link arms, invite people in, and redeem their sin, we qualify for nations to run to us. Why aren't nations running to the church right now? Because the church shoots their own wounded. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we reverse that, as soon as we go into the restoration mode mm -hmm. with mercy and we Amen. look for failure as an opportunity to qualify that is excellent for God's best, then we get to swing the second edge of the mercy mm -hmm. sword. Second edge of the mercy sword is in that covenant also. And it's in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 7. I, David, I've been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. Mm -hmm. You could not be an enemy of King David and live. Mm -hmm. No way. That same covenant Jesus gives us on Resurrection Day and in the longest message preached in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, Acts 13, 32 to 34, the whole core of his uh, New Testament message to the church is on Resurrection Day, Jesus said, I give you the covenant of sure, sure mercy. mercy. Mm -hmm. So, how does sure mercy work? Well, King David is the example. His own son took his throne, his kingdom, uh, Zion, the, the, the nation, Jerusalem, the whole ball of wax, and David was running, fleeing for his life. He lost the army. 
He lost his office. Um, he, he literally lost everything and is on the run. He, he has no army to trust in. He's outnumbered, probably a thousand to one or, or more. He has one thing, prayer and his covenant. Mm -hmm. And so he prays. Psalm 143, verse 12, he prays on the way out of Jerusalem, in your mercy, cut off all those who try to destroy my soul. Mm -hmm. And in a good month, month and a half, two months later, Ahithophel is dead, Absalom is on the run, and all of a sudden David is restored. Mm -hmm. God restored him, and then he made him an example to all of us about how God redeems failure. That's awesome. It is awesome. awesome. All right, let's look at this pattern in Joel chapter 2. It starts in verse 17. Now, this was in January this year. The Lord spoke to me about this. And in verses 17 to 19 of, of uh, Joel 2, it it's, uh, says, Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for His land and pity His people. The Lord will answer and say to His people, Behold, I will send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied by them, and you will no longer be a reproach, or I will redeem your failures. All right. So in Joel, we see a manifestation of the sure mercies of David. And the priests are told, Pray, pray, pray. Now, the Lord spoke to me about this, and He said, This started almost 40 years ago. And you were at the meeting where it started in, in uh, Melody Land Christian Center in Anaheim, California, <laughs> when they presented 2 Chronicles 714 as a national movement. We want to take this across the nation. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven, I will Amen. intervene, and I will heal their land. Mm -hmm. For 40 years, we have been praying that. Groups have been praying that, have picking up that call. And the Lord said, what finished that season was when Franklin Graham went to all 50 states and invited the church to come pray with him over this election. It was a powerful meeting. I was at the Austin gathering and a true move of God took place that day as we repented and interceded. You know, we've prayed that prayer, as you've said, year after year after year, especially National Day of Prayer. Yes. But that particular day, um, just because of the anointing on Franklin Graham and the timing of God, and I'm sure the prayer machine that Billy Graham Ministries is, <laughs> brought forth a true repentance across the crowd. It was different. It was very different. And I thought that day, I said, if that move of the Spirit, if, if the Spirit moves that way in every state capital, we're going to see the effect of a, a righteous prayer, you know, effectual prayer of a righteous man availing much. You participated yeah. in what the Lord spoke to me about and said that that act in all 50 states, mm -hmm. that filled the cup of intercession Thank the Lord. That triggered a divine intervention. And that divine intervention has a name, Donald Trump. He didn't even expect to be elected out of his own mouth. He said that. So we have in office right now a, a God chosen, one that most of us would have not chosen. Absolutely. I mean, but one mm -hmm. God chose probably because God knew his heart, a little rough around the edges, but I mean, who was it when we came into the kingdom? Truth. And um, now we have a believing, praying president, and we have one that is going to be hearing the input that comes from the church. First time in my life, 40 plus years in ministry, anybody running for office has ever promised we will get rid of the Johnson rule so that when you go in your pulpit, you can say what you hear God saying mm -hmm. without reservation. That's right. Now tell me that isn't God. Come on. Amen. The Johnson rule was uh, a rule that Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson put into place. So it's not even that long ago that that took place. And it was just for more, a further uh, separation of church and state, so to speak. Am I correct? It was a gag, gag rule mm -hmm. for pastors and leaders mm -hmm. so that you could not speak 
about anything political exactly. in your pulpit. Exactly, right, right. And they called it separation of church and state. Yeah, that's what they called it. Right. I, I mean, when you look at the prophets, the prophets were never silent True. about what was going on politically in their nation. They always had something to say. And it was usually stop what right, you're doing right. or you're, the whole nation's going into judgment. Right. Well, the first part of this pattern that we see in Joel 2, pray, 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 and then God will intervene. And that's verse 20. All right, we are seeing this pattern unfold before our very eyes. And it says then in verse 23, Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former and the latter. In the first month, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat. The vat shall overflow. Now, for anybody reading Joel 2.24, what you need to do is write in overflow, to, quote, too much, end quote. Because the pattern that unfolds here appears four other places in Scripture. In Joel 2, it's prophesied about the last days and about winding up the age. But to see the intervention from prayer to uh, God re judicially removing the northern army or giving us a new, God's judicial intervention here is He removes the northern army that has come against uh, Judah. All right, because uh, Joel is ministering to Judah, and he's, he's promising them, look, here's, here's what God's going to do if you will pray. But the first place we see this pattern unfold in Scripture is in Exodus. So in Exodus, in Exodus 1 and 2, the people are in bondage, okay? And it's not minor bondage, it's major bondage. And they're crying out, God, you're the only one that can turn this captivity. God, you have to move. And in Exodus 2, it says, verse 23, 24, and 25, Now it happened in the process of time the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God. God heard the groaning. Now that's what happened up to this election. You experienced it in Austin. You saw the move of the Spirit. God heard what you groaned, what every at every state capital, and God and God acknowledged, just like God acknowledged the groaning of the Egyptians, He acknowledged the prayers of American church in November of this year, prior to November, on all 50 states. We got the answer in November. All right, that was the intervention. But notice what this intervention looks like. And those are your next verses, 17, 18, 19, and Joel 20, 21. This is called a judicial anointing, and it's explained in Exodus 6. In Exodus 6, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go. With a strong hand he will drive them out of the land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Oh, okay, Yahweh, Jehovah. This is the first place God talks to Israel as I'm going to visit you as Jehovah. They have known him before. Verse 3, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. El Shaddai, mm -hmm. your provider, all right? Your provider, your protector. But I was not known to them as Jehovah. Which says in the, in the concordance, the national God of Israel. The national God of Israel. And Amen. then he's explained here in verse 6, all right? And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah. I will bring you out from under the burdens, the bondage of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Mm -hmm. Jehovah is the God who saves through judgment. Now, we know the God who saves through love, through salvation, through the cross, mm -hmm. but Jesus is both, Acts 2, 36. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both kurios, judge of all the earth, Christos, savior of all the earth. Mm -hmm. Judge, savior. Mm -hmm. All my life we've emphasized the savior. But what you find in this biblical pattern 
that judgment becomes in the last days when deep darkness covers the people. Judgment, judicial intervention becomes your primary agent of salvation. I never got that in seminary. I spent three years in a decent seminary. Not one time did I ever get that in seminary. Not one. But the Holy Spirit made it a part of Scripture. So break that down just a little bit. So when, when God's judgments begin to come into the earth, you're saying that they turn. They have a purpose. They have a purpose. The purpose, of, and that purpose is revealed in the judgments of Egypt. Okay. Almost every judgment mm -hmm. that we see in Egypt, there's this phrase, and then you shall know, know yada, the ultimate in intimacy. Mm -hmm. There's such deep darkness, people are not going to know the Lord unless a judicial intervention restores the fear of God. Mm, okay. When the fear of God is restored, then they are open they're able to, to salvation. Know God. They're, they're able, able to discern yes. and see and okay. go, oh, God loves me. Oh, they're, mm -hmm. they're open to the message. Until the judgment breaks through, mm -hmm. then they're not even open to the message. Mm -hmm. So as a church, we have to possess this judicial anointing to save. I mean, the judicial anointing is not to destroy. It's not to hurt. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to save. Mm -hmm. The purpose is God give us a generation. God give us our nation back. But they have to see who you are. See who God is. As yeah. the judge of all the earth mm -hmm. to open them up, mm -hmm. to break the darkness off, to part the curtains that are blinding their eyes. Mm -hmm. They have to see it. And I mean, it's stunning to go through this because it makes you rethink the issue of judgment. Mm -hmm. Tradition has made us afraid to judge. So tradition has, has really literally closed this door to the primary agent of salvation in the last days. Now, th now th if you think about that, that is stunning. The very thing that God ordained to give us our greatest harvest, tradition has closed the door to it, mm -hmm. and we're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. and we won't touch it. That's where the change has to come. Here, here, come on, God, let's go. We can't do the judgment. Moses couldn't do the judgment. God has to do the judgment. So, and, and you know, one of the, the interesting things about uh, Scripture, especially Isaiah, Isaiah 26 tells us exactly how deep that darkness is and what it is like in the last day. Listen to this, Isaiah 26, <coughs> and I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified Bible. All right, Isaiah 26, 9, 10, and 11. My soul yearns for you, O Lord, in the night. Yes, my spirit within me seeks you earnestly. For only when your judgments, only when your judgments are in the earth will the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God. Though favor is shown to the wicked. What have we been doing for 40 years? We've been gracing <coughs> the wicked. Excuse me. We've been showing them favor, <clears throat> yet they do not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, they deal perversely and refuse to see the majesty of the Lord. Though your hand is lifted high to strike, Lord, they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Yes, let the fire reserved for your enemies consume them. So, in, in uh, Psalm 9, Verse 21, David is praying, put them in, put the nations in fear, mm -hmm. the judicial intervention, put them in fear so that they may know you. Amen. We have about three minutes left and I'm just wondering, you know, we are seeing so much turbulence right now in the earth, um, nations shaking, uh, shifting, even, you know, recent uh, move uh, by our president in Syria. Um, are you, how are you likening what you're teaching to what we're seeing going on in the earth right now? We have had utter, total, and complete passivity. Mm -hmm. we, I'm gonna draw a line. This is a line in the sand. You use chemical weapons and there will be consequences. Assad used chemical weapons, 
no consequences, zero, none, zip, nada. Are you kidding me? What happened to America? Did we crawl into a cave? Did we start hiding? Have you noticed there is a change? There is a new sheriff in town, and what do you see coming out of that sheriff? You see a, what is like a God response. If you're going to murder innocent children, if you're going to use sarin gas, are you kidding me, a horrible death, then I'm going to destroy the airfield. And I, apparently all the pictures after those 50 tomahawks or however many they sent in is a total destruction mm -hmm. of that airfield. So that would be uh, likened to a judgment Exactly. Okay, that's a judgment, and then that will cause evil men to fear. To fear. To fear. It's when mercy or allowing things to continue, whether we're talking about a government or whether we would be talking about something else in our school systems or just along those lines, uh, as right. long as we have continued the way we have, that's not mercy because the fear of God does not come forth. We have about a minute left. That's enablement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because of our theology mm -hmm. and what we've been taught about mercy, we have mercied people thinking we were giving them time to, for salvation, but what it's turned into is enablement. We have hardened them in yeah, their sin that's true. rather than putting a bit and bridle in their mouth and say, here are the consequences for mm -hmm. your action. Stop doing this or you will die. Mm -hmm. Now, a God of mercy, that's how a God of mercy acts. Mm -hmm. Stop doing this or you will die. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you how to be saved. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. your setup. Here comes the judgment. Here comes the message of salvation. Right, right. Just like Paul in Acts 13. Blind the false prophet. All of a sudden, a proconsul wouldn't give him a visa. Here's your visa. It's all yours. <laughs> go, 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 go. Right, go. right. That's how judgment works in the last days. The Bible's full of it, even the New Testament. Right. Well, it's very interesting, very powerful. Um, I'm going to have you in the next program just pick up right where we left off and continue with this pattern, uh, uh, prophetic pattern for the church to wind up the age. Thank you so much for sharing thus far. And I know that this is new for some of you. Uh, tune in next week and um, we'll give you part two of this teaching. God bless you and thank you for joining us on The Gathering.